Thank you. Thank you so, for having us. Yeah, I guess, you know, best place to start is introductions. If you could just introduce yourselves, share a little bit more about um, your journey and where you are in your current role at your current organization. Absolutely. So with that, so uh, I just want to start thing. Thank you, everyone, for joining us today. It's a, a late hour on Friday, and uh, this is definitely our time. This is your time. Uh, so my name is Ingrid Gonzalez, and I uh, just want to share a little bit about my background. So um, I grew up in the mountain in the south of France. Uh, so I, I come from a very poor family, uh, very diverse, very international, Italian, Spanish roots. Uh, I grew up in a 500 people town <laughs> where there were more animals than human beings, but with determination and greed. I had the opportunity to graduate from a, a master degree in entrepreneurship from a top business school in Europe. And uh, I've been for the past 17 years in tech, technology, innovation. I work for the four largest companies in the world, IBM, Dell, Microsoft, and, uh, and Google in three different continents. And uh, I today, I, I just wanted to introduce myself as a, a really representing two of the largest uh, organization I'm passionate about. One is Google, Google Cloud, Positive Planet. Uh, Positive Planet is my passion, it's my life, it's a non-profit organization that I uh, um, had the opportunity uh, to lead since uh, the past July, since the pandemic. And the goal of Positive Planet is to support underserved community uh, to leave poverty uh, through entrepreneurship. And, and today themes was, was all about, and I was very excited and, and be with all of you because uh, the, the theme was, what does collaborative leadership means to me, Ingrid? So as a leader, your purpose is to really create a diverse and inclusive environment and, um, you know, where everyone feels value included and have a voice. So I have decided uh, to lead by example. So I just wanted to give you a, a, a like, share a little story with you about what happened last year during the pandemic. Um, I was not very happy. I was lonely. I was sad and very, very isolated. And I, I decided to leave America to uh, to be close to my family back in France, in Europe, and, uh, and find support and comfort like many of you had. So right away, I went to my HR lead and uh, expressed the desire to leave the country and to be and to foster an environment around me where I could be me and could have a voice and, and definitely uh, connect with my organization, with myself and with my team. And uh, it was not easy, but very uh, because I had a voice, because I expressed a desire, uh, I made that happen. Uh, and uh, I was very excited to uh, to 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 leave and to be close to uh, an environment where I felt like uh, I could, you know, be me again and express myself. I give the best to my organization, to my team and, and, to, uh, and to my family as well. So what I want to share with all of you today in terms of, you know, with the theme of collaboration, it, it changed my entire life. It changed my entire team dynamic. Everyone, because they saw me, I was doing it. Everyone felt relaxed. So ready to give their best, ready also to be able and say, okay, I want to do the same. I wanted to create and foster an environment around me where I can be me, when I can collaborate, when I can be myself and can give the best. And um, what I want to share with all of you tonight is that thanks to that in environment that you personally create around yourself, uh, you can make the impossible be possible. And I just want to share with you some numbers is that Last year, we were awarded at Google at being the top performing team in America. We received a Stratosphere Award, top recognition in the world during the time where, you know, New York was hit at the worst. But because we re-evaluate re the way we were talking, engaging, collaborating, and respecting each other and meeting each other where we were in our life, in our personal life and professional life, we were able to be uh, extremely successful. So I'm very excited to be with all of you tonight. Thank you very much for the opportunity. I'm looking forward to uh, the Q&A and, and, and to get to know you better and share with you a little bit more about my experience.
But um, thank you very much again for joining us, and uh, um, I would be happy to uh, take any questions further. Thank you, Ingrid. <laughs> Maybe Dr. McCabe, if you'd like to introduce yourself and tell us a bit more about your, um, your role in your organization. Wonderful. Thank you so much for this opportunity to join this conversation about I think I was muted. I'm so sorry. Um, yes. Thank you so much for this opportunity to join this conversation about collaborative leadership and to honor International Women's History Month. As a woman, a Black woman, as a women's health provider, it is such an honor to join this conversation because at the intersection of women's health and empowerment and education is where my passion lies. So I am a mother, I am a partner, and I am a leader. I lead a division of about 21 physicians and an additional 20 advanced practice providers at the University of Wisconsin School of Medicine and Public Health. And in that role, I am responsible for the clinical mission as well as the academic mission of our general obstetrics and gynecology division. So when we talk about collaborating, when we talk about caring and compassion and leadership, it is really fundamental to everything that I do as a leader. Whether or not I'm in a delivery room, assisting with bringing new life into the world in the operating room, leading a team that's helping me perform surgery, or if it's in the classroom where I'm teaching the next generation of residents and medical students how to care for women, um, collaborating with these multidisciplinary teams is critical. And I will tell you over this past year, the past 13 months, the concept and notion of collaborative leadership has just gone to the next level for me, because certainly we wouldn't have been able to do what we needed to do as a team without that collaborative approach. I'll just, you know, take you back a year uh, in the past. Um, on a Friday evening, it was March 13th. Uh, you know what they say about Friday the 13th. Well, it was a very harrowing uh, day for me. It was very clear at that moment for me that our team was going to have to have this all hands on deck approach to develop a response to the emerging COVID pandemic. And for us as women's health providers, we had to figure out how we could stand up telehealth services in a less than 48 hour period. And if you know anything about obstetrics and gynecology, our world is the pelvis. And our work has traditionally relied on face-to-face, in-person examinations and conversations. So we were challenged with how do we continue to provide care for these women who were going to need care regardless of any social, physical distancing restrictions that were coming down the pike? And I am so pleased to say that we all got together over a weekend on using, um, it, you know, it seems so out of date, but we were using a conference call line and we got together to figure out how we could stand up technology so that we could meet our patients' needs on Monday morning at eight o'clock when those hundreds of patients were due to come into our clinic. So the way we were able to do that and to do that successfully, to deliver that care over the past 13 months is because we came together around a common goal. We were able to take care of one another because I, I must remind everyone, we were dealing with frontline issues that we were facing um, perilous situations, you know, thinking about our own health, um, the health of our families. Everyone on my team, with the exception of one person, is a mother of young children. So we had to learn to take care of ourselves, have to take care of each other and collaborate so we could bring our whole selves to the mission that was critical and that is taking care of other women. Uh, 
Oh, thank you. Anyone want to go next? I think we have Portia, if you want to share a bit more about yourself and um, also talk about maybe what does collaborative leadership look like in your world? Yeah, thank you so much. I'm, I'm so thrilled to be on this panel after, after hearing from our speakers and can't wait to hear from everyone else. Um, it's really exciting to be here and I, I am really looking forward to exploring what collaborative leadership and leading with our whole selves actually means in practice. Um, so just a bit about my background. I um, am from the New York area. I um, have family who's pr pretty close to me at this point. I'm still on the East Coast. And um, I started out my career, I usually say generally, in the people and culture space. I, I did a little bit of HR stuff. I did a little bit of, of talent acquisition or recruiting. I, I did some work in diversity and inclusion. Um, all within the advertising industry. And at a certain point, I really connected with learning as this lifelong process. And I started to question why learning and development, employee growth and development wasn't more at the forefront of some of the, the uh, companies I was, I was working for. Um, so that led me to the practice of learning and development. Um, after leaving advertising, I ventured over to Spotify and moved into a, a global role and a global team where we really started to explore what learning actually means in practice, all of the different sort of innovative ways that you can approach creating really interesting sticky learning experiences um, for, for, for different kinds of learners. Um, and I really began to center around working with, um, working with the topics of leadership development in that role um, and started to see just how growth and collaboration could actually take form, depending on sort of which team you're on, which part of the company you're in. So that brings me to, to where I am now, which is uh, at Netflix. Um, just a little bit about us, we're, we're aiming to continue shaping the future of global entertainment because we believe that there's a better way to have people find and discover the content that they really love to watch. Um, the past year has been great um, for, for Netflix to put it generally, um, but there is so much more that, that can be done um, for our business. Um, so here at Netflix, I'm in the learning and development space. And so what that means is I work on a team of other folks in L&D who have different special specializations, but we mainly partner with our talent organization and leaders and product to design and develop learning experiences to meet the needs of our ever-growing, truly global at this point, workforce. And we integrate key aspects of our culture, um, uh, like context, not control, and freedom and responsibility, really key Netflix culture tenets, which means we typically lean away from defining learning uh, processes or experiences and more towards enabling leaders to create the right experience for their team. And so collaboration, is actually woven throughout all of our core values at Netflix. And we are passionate learners, uh, but how we approach learning development and specifically collaboration has really changed pretty significantly over the past year. Um, so I wanna share just a bit, like, like many of you, uh, Netflix had leaders who were at the top of the year last year, previously clustered in these sort of geographic areas and previously had um, really put a premium on in-person connections as a way to foster collaboration. But now after sort of being globally distributed, um, we have a lot of folks who are collectively realizing that uh, proximity doesn't automatically correlate with collaboration. Collaboration is really a mindset that takes work to cultivate. Um, and there are so many challenges, obviously, that's, uh, that has already been shared, but so many challenges that came up over the last year um, that our leaders were really challenged to work through, one of which was how do we maintain collaboration in this space, right? How do we still kind of balance um, leaving room for our team members to discuss what, what's going on uh, in their personal lives, to really uh, have the space to talk about how what's going on in the world is affecting their work, but still sort of moving things forward and still a, a, enabling and fostering the kind of collaboration that moves our business forward. Um, and so as someone in the learning design and development space, I've been in the unique position of exploring 
spaces and conversations that seek to promote group collaboration. Um, and so what we've realized is, is, again, what I mentioned before is that collaboration goes well beyond working together. It's a mindset. And I'll, I'll speak a little bit more to kind of how that impacts women a, a little bit later. But I believe that um, from what I've seen, um, the, the leaders who are women in our country, uh, in our uh, company, excuse me, have really stepped up in this space and have really leaned into leading with with parts of themselves that are totally authentic in order to facilitate collaboration for their teams. And um, so I'm really interested to, to again hear from others and to talk a little bit further about what that means, what that intersection has looked like, especially given the past year. Thank you. Thank you. And Leia, um, you could share a little bit more about your journey and maybe what collaborative leadership also looks like to you. Yes, thank you. Everyone, it's such an honor to be speaking with you all and hear your stories, Ingrid and Portia, Dr. Williams, thank you so much. And for those of you who were not in the workshop, my name is Leah Bonvasudo. I'm a communication coach and founder of Present Voices, where I help people communicate with more confidence off the cuff through coaching and community. I was raised by a mime and a Broadway musician. So naturally I had a ton of social anxiety and I was gravitated towards theater very early on because there were a script, there were rules, there was a way to have permission to interact with other human beings, but it wasn't quite enough. And about 10 years ago, I started to do the work I do now in healthcare, particularly at a public hospital in Brooklyn, helping frontline staff deescalate situations, advocate for themselves and their patients and generally feel more heard. And that is my work today. Today, my work is living theater and I help individuals and teams use their own voices and tell their own stories so that they can bring their whole selves to work. I believe that collaborative leadership is true leadership. Collaborative leadership is not aggressive, oppressive, or my way or the highway. And that kind of leadership is rooted in white supremacy. Collaborative leadership is inclusive, receptive, open, vulnerable, but it is also direct and clear and strong. Collaborative leadership means that workers feel heard and can bring their whole selves to work. And now I bring my whole self to work by Make, leaving my bed a little messy sometimes, or by letting you all know that my mother's in the hospital right now, and that makes it really hard to focus, or just by being confident being where I am. But that is a privilege in itself. I run my own business. I am my own boss. I am white, and that brings with it so much privilege. And so what we have to remember is how psychologically damaging it is to prevent people from bringing their whole selves to work. The most important thing I want us to remember in this moment is how much people are suffering and that the trauma is right now, it's happening right now and particularly for colleagues of color. Workplaces are not necessarily psychologically safe and for a lot of people, the workplaces have entered our homes. And so bringing our whole selves to work requires demanding that workplaces allow everyone to do the same. Thank you. That was so great. I'm going to go off of presenting so that we could see each other a bit better. How do I close this? Okay. Great. Thank you so much. As everyone can tell, we have people from, you know, the panelists have such different, fascinating um, backgrounds and have led in different teams across different industries. And I think, you know, kind of what Leia said, it's like collaborative leadership is true leadership. So definitely I'm gonna sit with that. So to kind of dive in onto the theme of courage to create, Ingrid, this question goes to you. Um, I know you recently launched a nonprofit to help women um, during the pandemic. If you could share a little bit more about what inspired you to do that and what work you're doing with that nonprofit. Do we still have Ingrid on? Technical difficulties, just one sec, sorry. Okay. <laughs> okay, let's definitely make sure she's back on, but I could also, we could continue. I wanna make sure she's part of the conversation. We'll hold space for a second. Thank you, everyone. 
Uh, are you, I'm back. Are you, do you see me? I just cannot even turn on my camera. So uh, let me try again. Sorry for that. <laughs> nice. Can you hear me now? Yes, we could hear you. Okay, super, Carolina. So I apologize for that. You know, technology, I love, I work in technology. Yeah. So <laughs> it's just yeah. sometimes when it works, it's beautiful, it's magnificent. When it doesn't work, it's like, okay. <laughs> no worries. So let I'm me know sure. when you are, when we start over and apologize. Yeah, no worries whatsoever. We're rolling through all these technical difficulties the best way we can. I'm not sure if you wanted to also be on video. I want, I'm trying, I ask, I'm requesting, can I be on video? You just maybe have to uh, <laughs> accept me. <laughs> I don't know what's going on. If no, you, we can go with uh, our Porsche and we come back. I try to reconnect, no worries. Yes, no worries. Um, I guess going over, uh, Thank you know, you. Hopping, no problem. Hopefully Navi and Eva can help you get squared away on the back end. But um, moving on to Dr. Williams, you have an incredible background as a health leader and especially during a pandemic. <laughs> can you share a little bit more about what does work-life balance mean to you? And um, maybe share some advice for some people who are also struggling to find work-life balance in whatever industry they're in? Sure, you know, this, um, I, I really appreciate this question because the subject of work life balance has been something that I have been working on uh, for many, many years. And it actually is the thing that brought me to my current leadership role. When I started at the University of Wisconsin, I actually just came on as a academic physician, primarily seeing patient care. But what we found was we had really high physician turnover and there was dissatisfaction and I was tapped to lead a task force to look at what, what was driving this turnover. And you know what I found was people were not actually able to bring their whole selves to work. Physicians were burned out. They were doing their academic work in the margins of their time. And you know, so the way in which we work, we might be up all night and then they were left to, uh, to learn, to teach, um, to prepare presentations, maybe write papers on nights, on weekends. And that was burning people out and people were leaving. And so I set about trying to figure out how we could create a more inclusive environment so that people could engage in all of those things that led them to a career in academic medicine. Um, and we were able to successfully overhaul the way in which we worked. And that redesign actually facilitated us being able to pivot to a different um, way of working during COVID. So, you know, it's at the conclusion of doing that work as well, you know, this own personal quest of trying to find balance in my life that I've come to the conclusion there is no work-life balance. It is elusive. It is a Sisyphean task that will never be accomplished. You're just going to keep rolling the boulder up the hill and it's going to come back down. What we should really be striving for is work-life integration. How can you look at the things that you want to do professionally? and integrate those things with what you want to do and you find meaningful personally. And for me, so Janu I'll take you back to January, 2020. I wrote three statements on post-it notes and I posted them on my bathroom, on my bathroom. mirror. The first one, the first one said, said, my self-care self -care is non-negotiable. The second one said, my family time is non-negotiable. That second one is really important because by nature, my default is to work. I like to work. I feel uh, very fulfilled by the work that I do as a physician, as a leader. So I needed to be declarative and intentional that my family time was going to be non-negotiable. And the last statement said, I am not taking on new projects at this time. 
you can consult with me in October of 2020, and I will see if I have capacity to do that work in 2021. And I needed to be very intentional about seeing those statements and creating those, that language that I could refer to, that could roll off of my lips, that I could rehearse on a daily basis in the interest of creating a better work life, an integrated work life. So even though 2020, you know, a couple months later, things turned out much differently than I had anticipated, those three statements did serve as a compass for me as the year went on. And certainly there was a lot to contend with. I mean, you know, talk about bringing your whole self to work. I had kids at home. My husband is also in healthcare. So at some point our house felt like a COVID command center. Um, so trying to take care of my team, trying to take care of my children. Um, and then, you know, when we were met with such racial unrest, like how do we do all of those things? How do we integrate? How do we find, um, dare I say it, how do we find balance? Um, I will tell you at the end of the year, my life was really good. I was able to connect with people because I did have those declarative statements. I was very clear about what, it, what the kind of work I wanted to be doing, what was important and meaningful for me to do at home. And so when work came home, um, I was able to integrate. So I would, you know, my advice is be very intentional. If you want to find balance or if you want to have an integrated life, be very intentional about what it is you want to do at work. Be very intentional about what is meaningful for you at home and protect those things so that they fit together quite nicely. Thank you. I know a couple of us were laughing, nodding our heads. I know a couple of us were Sorry, I think we're getting a bit of feedback. Um, but when you said, see you in 2021, <laughs> it definitely resonated with me. I know a couple of us are laughing about that. And so you also said something about, you know, redesigning the way we work. And it helps, you can't help but to think of Portia, you know, you at Netflix, you, your specialty on learning and designing, and you work with a lot of leaders um, to help foster this mindset of uh, collaborative leadership. If you could share a little bit more about how do you help people tap into that and um, and how and see how they could harness their power to leave lead more collaboratively while also leading with their whole selves? Yeah, and I'm I'm so glad that we're talking about just the relevancy of the last year because I don't think that we could have this mm -hmm. conversation if we didn't mention that as well. So particularly in this last year, I've noticed that what I mentioned before, collaboration, um, the the actual definition of it goes well beyond just working together. Like I mentioned earlier, we have leaders internally who've, who've realized that proximity does not correlate with co collaboration. I think that is um, common belief sometimes in certain tech spaces, and it's just, it's not true. Um, it's a mindset, not a set of tools, and it's really rooted in trust and empathy, right? Trust in one another, your teammates, your peers, trust in the process of collaboration, and trust in oneself. And so that, of course, involves establishing psychological safety like we talked about, but it also involves getting really clear with your own sense of self and knowing how you wanna show up as a leader. So I'll, I'll just speak from my own experience. Um, oftentimes I've felt that in environments where I've, I've been a part um, um, of teams where women are more present in leadership positions, those environments tend to be more collaborative in general. But I've also seen how in environments where collaboration takes on this sort of one dimensional definition of just being close together and sort of just, just building consensus uh, because we're around one another, that can actually slow things down and ultimately diminish, uh, diminish the, the returns on what we're trying to create. Um, so especially given the last year, I think that it's important to really define what collaboration means and what collaborative leadership looks like and practice for your organization, um, because it's going to look different everywhere, especially given what we've all been through this past year and are still going through. I need to change my language to be present day, okay? Um, so from a learning and development perspective, 
right? The question myself and my team are always coming back to is how do, how do we help people practice that? How do we help people to define what this means and also define what collaborative behaviors look like in practice? And when I say collaborative leadership, I, I'm not just talking about folks who lead teams. Like you can lead as an individual contributor. Their leadership is not sort of just relegated to the folks who may have a manager or a director title. Um, leadership can come from so many different um, corners of the organization. So I just want to say that. Uh, but we think about, again, what it takes to define what those behaviors look like in practice. Um, how do we support individuals, particularly women, in fostering the collaboration skills that translate across functions, across organizational boundaries? How do you uh, get to understand how you want to show up as a collaborative leader and also as a collaborative teammate, right? Um, some of the, the big questions we've been tackling this last year is, especially for our leaders, is do you lead from a place of empathy and do you openly share knowledge to prevent knowledge uh, and information silos? Again, all rooted in best practices for collaboration, right? You want people to have access to the information that they need to grow and create and be innovative. Um, if we take a step back and, and look at some of the questions we've been grappling with, all of the, the qualities of, of collaboration, all the qualities of a collaborative leader takes bravery and authenticity. And those are things that make all the difference in collaboration, but they also take quite a bit of effort. Um, let's not ignore that as women, we're already so stretched in how we're expected to show up. Um, and so as, as we've explored this internally, we've realized there's there's no like magic wand here. As, as women, especially, I think we have to be uh, really clear with our own sense of self so that we can lead collaboratively, whether you are leading a team or whether you are an individual uh, contributor. Um, we want to be really clear about what our boundaries are. I like what Dr. Williams said about see you in 2021, right? I think at, at the end of the day, um, collaboration requires more than, than, like I said, that proximity piece, more than just um, um, the output. It, it requires a, a level of trust, authenticity, bravery, and also vulnerability to really be able to, to hear from one another and, and create great work. Um, and so again, I think, I think as, as women, if we can be clear with our own sense of self and be sure of how we want to show up, how we want to define collaborative leadership on our own terms, that will help to, to move us forward. Um, and hopefully protect our, our, our space, protect our, our own selves, our, our mental health in the process of being clear about those, those boundaries and really being sure of how we want to show up. Thank you, Portia, letting us, you know, reminding us that it's sort of, it's leadership at all levels. Um, so Ingrid, good to have you back. <laughs> um, would love to, you know, hear the, oh, I'm getting some feedback. Oh, I'm getting some feedback. Anyone else here? I'm here. Can you hear me? <clears throat> Carolina, you are mute. Okay, am I, am I back? <laughs> You're back. Okay, I am getting some feedback. Am I the only one? Okay, <laughs> well, good to have you back, Ingrid. Um, you know, you were talking about how you've led by example at Google um, with collaborative leadership. And I was wondering if you could share a little bit more about your nonprofit and how you're also leading by example in that space by supporting other women and empowering women, especially during a pandemic. Thank you. Thank you very much for, for your question. I, I really love the theme when you, you and I, we discuss and we brainstorm about, you know, have the courage to create, right? And um, as I mentioned to the, to the audience earlier, I said, you know, I come from a very uh, a background where, you know, women ha didn't have a voice, didn't have a uh, 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 the power and uh, and then now I had the opportunity to lead my career to work for a very large global organization and uh, and uh, with the little of experience I have I and with the voice I have I decided to create a change and to lead 
uh, and have the courage uh, to accept a mission, a very important mission last year during the pandemic uh, to become the president and chairwoman of a nonprofit organization uh, called a name uh, Positive Planet. So at the beginning, you know, have the imposter syndrome, say, why me? Why now? Uh, can I do that? Uh, that sure. And the president of the organization said, yes, we want you to be the voice. We want with your career, with your experience, we want you to inspire people. They come from nothing and they can change their life and, and, and have a really an impact in their own life, their family, and definitely on the, on the community. So as all you know, last year was a, one of the saddest uh, year in decades. Uh, people were dying, people were suffering, people were isolated. And, uh, and America was just, uh, for me, I joined America 10 years ago, but it was just the, uh, all around me, people are very, uh, very, very impacted. So um, I decided to sign up for the challenge, even if I believe I, I couldn't do it, but I, I did it. I took uh, the role and responsibility and with a focus to build a better uh, and more inclusive world around me. So really the goal of Positive Planet is to, uh, to look at underserved community around us and to help uh, women. And we start our first project, we help being women uh, uh, entrepreneurs. We had an idea, amazing idea to help them to, uh, to go and, and, and achieve uh, from the impossible to possible. But it was just also uh, it, with my team, we started with one uh, volunteer in July during the pandemic. Now with 65, created a board of directors and focusing on meeting people where they are with ideas and many amazing potential and, uh, and, and really helping and, and support them. So uh, uh, Positive Planet is about, you know, volunteers, coaches, partnership with global large organizations like Capgemini or Genpark, have a one-on-one coaching, we build a digital platform. We are working in digital inclusion. The goal is we start with five women entrepreneurs in New York. The goal is to go to 15 Q2 at 100 by end of year, and maybe 2022 is it's, it's possible. Uh, uh, helping and supporting thousands of uh, women entrepreneurs that want to really to uh, to change the game because we know in America women have been very impacted uh, these past years, and uh, we wanted to support and and provide so. Uh, you know, with uh, have the courage is then, you know, when you're more comfortable in your life, and this was my case uh, at the stage of my career, is to just lead by example. When I say that is about expressing a voice, not everyone will hear your voice, but it's definitely to, if you're passionate, you want to give back to your community, uh, it's something you can do. Uh, and uh, even if I feel I couldn't, I had people around me that gave me the strengths and the power to say, yes, I can. And I took that role and responsibility. And you know, when I wake up in the morning, when I see the impact you can have around you uh, for this women entrepreneur, and we go even further. We are uh, working with um, Long Island Boot Fang and we are delivering food and, uh, and things of first necessity for the people they have nothing in New York. So uh, we are uh, uh, really uh, trying to have an impact at small level and hopefully uh, in the future, very, uh, very big impact. But if you wanted to participate to this uh, journey, uh, we are welcoming volunteer. You are welcoming donation just to uh, to like look next door uh, next year from you. It's these people that really need your help and need to uh, uh, to uh, to have uh, you as a human being. And, and if you want to volunteer to uh, to look at them and uh, and have an impact, so uh, it's just uh, very. Uh, I'm very appreciative for all of you to uh, again giving us time today. And there's so many ways of. Uh, giving back to our community. And this is my way last year to act and to impact. And it was to uh, really take that role. I believe I couldn't do it. Uh, but now uh, when I see the impact and the smile on a woman's faces that we help them to uh, find and create their own job and help their family to survive and leave poverty is uh, something that I'm very passionate about. So very happy to uh, follow the conversation. But uh, yeah, the, 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 the theme of uh, today's event was very inspiring for me. And again, I'm appreciative of uh, you having me. Thank you for sharing that, Ingrid. Um, we'll be sharing, we'll drop the link in the chat for anyone else that wants to find out more about Positive Planet, wants to volunteer. It sounds incredible. Um, and so moving on to Leah, you know, as someone who also helps individuals, right, like 
find their inner power and strength. Can you talk a bit of, a bit more about that work? Like what type of um, leaders, you know, ha, you know, how do, what types of people, <laughs> how, how do they find that in their leadership style? And how do you see yourself um, as a leader when no one else looks like you? That's a question that I ask myself all the time and would love to hear your thoughts on that. Yeah, thank you. So today is the National Day of Action and Healing to Stop Asian Hate. And this is in response to the horrific violence against the AAPI community last week and ongoing, and it's been growing so much over the past year, 1900%. This also commemorates the anniversary, March 26, 1790, the Naturalization Act was signed into law prohibiting non-white people from becoming citizens of the United States. So I bring this up to say that we're socialized to see leaders a certain way. It's on purpose. And it's how white supremacy survives and thrives by holding on to power. And we've seen studies about this where they ask young girls to draw pictures of leaders and they draw confident looking straight white men in suits. Representative Ayanna Presley says, the people closest to the pain should be closest to the power. And so I believe that when it comes to us seeing ourselves as leaders, that the change will only come when, frankly, more black, brown, indigenous women of color are leading, are actually in charge. So not professional development and not DEI, it just can't be enough, actually in charge. As a communication coach, I often hear from heads of HR or CEOs or supervisors with feedback for their teammates. And the feedback is almost always about wanting people to have more confidence. But often the feedback is not specific, it's not actionable, and it leads to very harmful ways of incorporating that feedback without having the ability to incorporate. And then when you tell someone they don't have confidence, it actually makes them have less confidence. But I loved how Portia brought up the word trust because confidence, the definition of it is to trust yourself and those around you. It's actually to trust boldly. And it's impossible to communicate confidently when you don't feel safe. It's just absolutely not possible. So this is why insecure leadership just doesn't work. And it's why we need such a big change. Confidence is not happening at work for most people because our workplaces have not supported most types of voices. And this is absolutely going to be strengthened by diversity, but it's not only along certain diversity lines, it's quite far reaching. So until the time comes when more types of leaders are actually leading, what can we do in the meantime to hear from more of us? First of all, as has been so well said, to give yourself permission to lead, even if you don't feel like a leader, even if you're an individual contributor, especially if you're a reluctant leader. I was never a natural leader. It did not come naturally, but I felt pulled by mission and by a power of bringing people together. And so give yourself permission. Also, like we talked about in the workshop, refuse to be rushed or interrupted. And spaces that are rushing you or interrupting you for you know whatever the intention behind it, it's not serving your voice. Our voices must be heard. And so practice taking up space and maintaining your power and committing to your own definition of presence, which is gonna be very different than an HR head's definition of executive presence. And finally, if you have the power, how can you create space and opportunities for others? How can you make other people feel validated and heard? And that is leadership and that can happen at all levels. Lastly, I personally have been devoted to supporting organizations that are leading this way and to also spending my money there. And so this is what we can all think about. If you're looking, if you're interviewing, where do you wanna work? Can you work with leaders who are, who are really enforcing this where there actually is diversity in leadership? Ella spoke so well about how to look for that. Such great tips. Thank you so much. Thank you, Leia. It's really great tips um, on how to lead more confidently and also the importance of elevating and supporting our BIPOC um, leaders to help them also feel comfortable in, in to feel included in this space because that is what collaborative leadership looks like. Uh, so to kind of close, I know we um, might have a few questions towards the end. 
but just thinking about your own individual like leadership styles and how that may have transformed during the pandemic is there something that you are excited to continue harnessing and growing um in growing um in the year? Yeah, for, for me, it was really something very important this year. It was about embracing the growth mindset. So it's, uh, it's all about don't be worried to become a different version of yourself and change for the better and just uh, adjust and adapt with the environment you're in, with the team you're in, with the people that surround you that also change and be okay with be a little bit outside of your comfort zone and definitely in order to connect differently to meet people where they are and to uh, collaborate in a way that is very innovative for you and your team or your family and the people around you. So this is something I will leave with you. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah, for me, it is getting comfy with being vulnerable. I have seen really moving uh, um, expressions of vulnerability from people in my personal life, my teammates, other other folks at, at my company that have really, again, like just moved me and um, have really encouraged me to, to do the same. But I will share with you that historically, I have not felt comfortable or safe being vulnerable, especially at work, especially as a Black woman. And I think the, the, the last year has just sort of shown us all that like, Look, you're 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 going to have to um, be okay with with things not um, necessarily being as maybe buttoned up as you you normally would have before we went through this pandemic or, or still going through. Uh, there there have just been some expressions of, of vulnerability from others around me that have inspired me to tap into my own ability to be vulnerable and and lead from that place. And I think I I've been really surprised at what's pleasantly surprised at what's come out on the other side of, of me showing up in that way. And I'm hoping to continue to, to do more of that, to step into that, into that space. I will echo what both Portia and Ingrid um, shared. So having that growth mindset, um, while I thought I have always embraced a growth mindset, I will tell you this past year, also taught me to be vulnerable and to show up authentically. I am a the product of the South. So I grew up in Alabama. I grew up um, very much aware that I'm an African-American person, a woman, but those labels took on new meaning and a new weight over the past year. And I will tell you, I had spent most of my time in leadership segmenting myself, keeping my womanhood and my blackness in a box because I didn't feel as though they were completely welcomed or appreciated in leadership. Well, here we are sitting in 2021, having learned many lessons last year. And my leadership, I think is all the better because I am willing to use my voice as a woman, to speak to my Blackness, to advocate for all those who had this shared commonality with me. And so that is what will remain post-pandemic, post all of the sort of the stress that we had last year, is bringing my whole self, allowing my mind to embrace my whole self in leadership and sharing those vulnerabilities with those with whom I lead side by side and those who um, are following me to give them opportunities to bring their whole selves to work. I hope to bring forth warmth. I hope that warmth is brought forth for all of the wonderful people I work with. And I just want that for them because that is what we deserve is warmth in our workplaces and warmth in our lives. And we just need more of it right now to balance off the significant strength that has led the American economy for so long. Personally though, this past year has nearly broken me and we're still in it. It might still, 
this is hard and we're all really struggling, but the near breakingness of it has in, enforced the idea that I feel like I can do anything. And I hope that when we come out on the other side of this awful time, I hope that we believe in ourselves. I hope that we do not take other people's no's as fact. And I hope that we can truly lead with our whole selves and what that means to each of us here. Oh, it's such a pleasure to hear you all speak about this. And it's really been an honor to be a part of this conversation. Thank you. Thank you. It's good to have you back, Ingrid. Did you want to share something? <laughs> I don't know if I, you know, this was the most chaotic experience, but ladies, I see you smile, so it make me smile, and it's all about, okay, it's Friday night, it's just, uh, no, I'm, I'm hearing, I mean, I, I had the opportunity to hear all your your feedback, I'm very inspired by each one of you, Paul Charlie and, uh, and Makeba, about the, you know, your, your personal experience, and the way where we, uh, as women, wanted to, like, have a voice, change, and lead by example, and I'm very, uh, I'm very inspired by all of you, and definitely uh, would love to have an opportunity to uh, to speak with the audience, to take some questions, because we are, we're definitely here to serve you. We all do these uh, uh, events just to make sure that you feel like you supported. You're not alone. We are all in with you, depending the industry we're in, depending your goal in life. Uh, uh, that uh, you know, we we, we are experiencing things things that you are on a day-to-day -day basis at work in a personal life uh with uh you know peaks up and downs and the holocaustor so uh you know this is why i really love uh, you know this type of uh, uh, opportunities is to make sure that we we all connect and independently of uh, our culture where we come from in the world and uh and uh, we, we we feel that uh we, we can relate to each other so uh, i'm very excited to see if you have any questions and uh Looking forward to uh, to have a follow up conversation and and create a community. This is something I really am passionate about. <laughs> thank you. Yeah, thank you so much. This is definitely inspiring to me. So we do have a couple of questions. I have a DM um, from someone that says, "What are some red flags that can be gleaned during a job interview that the leadership of the company is not supportive and or collaborative? What kinds of questions can I ask during an interview to elicit that type of information about a company and its leadership?" Great question. I, you know, I really, as a, a, a leader who is often interviewing in different spaces, whether they are for residency spots or for people who are joining our team as healthcare providers, or, um, it, you know, it takes a whole network and a village of people to deliver healthcare. I think it's important for you to use your agency just as much as those individuals are interviewing you for a role, you are interviewing that organization to make sure that it is a good fit. So asking um, very respectful but direct questions about how, what is their approach to collaboration? What is their approach to inclusivity? and giving people opportunities to use their own respective voices. So I think if a leader is shying away from answering those questions, those very direct pointed questions, that is the red flag, that perhaps that is not the organization to which you want to align your talents and your efforts. Yeah, I mean, Magira, I just I, I love your answer. I, I think it's super important to be honest, direct, and you wanted to join an organization that looks like you, like you can relate to and feel like included where you can have a voice. And, you know, when I create Positive Planet, for me, and I create the board of director was super important to say, I want to create diversity, equity, and inclusion. So it starts with me as a responsibility. And my board of director today is 50% women, 50% men. And you know, you have to, I, again, I keep saying that, but you have to lead by example. Google, same thing. When I joined Google, I was ahead of diversity, equity, and inclusion. And when I was going to loop and when I was going to interview for a job, and when I see like I have 10 resumes for the same people looking the same way, I say no. Till I don't have a diverse panel, a diverse team thing that you're offering me from representative of our country, of our world, I'm not going to go for an interview loop. 
So as a leader, as a manager, as a hiring manager, you have that responsibility to say, no, I'm waiting till I don't have a representation that looks like the way I want my organization to look like. So you applying for a role, it's amazing. And I, I really encourage you to have a voice and say, okay, uh, is your uh, uh, organization diverse? So how many uh, amazing people coming from all diverse uh, country, uh, gender, etc., cetera, are, are part of the team? Because I wanted to be part of something big and growing. So yeah, encouraging you to, uh, to say that. And I think these many organizations today, they are very sensitive about, they don't know how to do it, but that at least they have the intention to do it, which is good. And then it's on you to help them to uh, to also create that new culture, new environment that foster, um, a, 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 you know, a place for everyone to feel comfortable and uh, feel happy about being part of the journey. So uh, I love your question. Thank you. That was really great. Thank you. I'm sure if anyone else wanted to um, answer that or I could jump to another question. And also another great question. How do you deal with unconscious bias on the job? <laughs> we all have experience with that. I, I, oh, yes. I will oh, yeah. on that. Right. Um, I think that any time you are encountering anything that looks like, feels like, is unconscious bias, never doubt what your gut instinct is telling you. I think oftentimes we are conditioned to doubt um, our own instincts around things like that, especially because unconscious bias can show up so many different ways. It can show up as overt bias. It can show up as, as just microaggressions or not just micro, but it can show up uh, in, in little little or, or, or very large scale ways. So the first thing is never ever doubt what your gut instinct is telling you about what you're experiencing. Don't let anyone else sway you from that either. The other thing that I found to be helpful is to find your community, find your people that are, are the ones that outside of your team, they, they may be out, outside of your, your department, but the, the people that you know you can tap to just openly connect with and talk to and share uh, your true authentic experience, share with them what you've seen and what you felt and, and find the people who you know will support you in, in that process of sharing. Um, I have found that, that through, through different pockets of community, some, you know, I've worked at organizations where there are no employee resource groups, right? So I have to like create my own, right? There are some places I've worked where I have to create my own like cabinet to consult with my, my trusted people and partners that I've identified as the ones that I will go to and lean on to um, connect with because you need to have an outlet and a way to, to talk about what's what's happening to you and what you're experiencing. And this is me speaking very broadly, very generally, not knowing what, what other mechanisms you may have in your workplace to help you actually work through those. I encourage you to, to lean on those um, mechanisms if, if they are in place. But those are two things that I just really wanted to bring forward about unconscious bias because it can show up in so many different ways. And I think our, our first instinct um, after sort of, you know, uh, realizing that something may be off is to doubt ourselves and that doesn't serve us well. So that and really finding the people to connect with who can help you navigate and help you through mm -hmm. I think that's really, really powerful when it comes to um, handling unconscious bias. And I, 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 I love your, your feedback, Rosha, but I think it's a, it's a responsibility and it's a day-to-day -day responsibility. It's not because you're a white woman and blah, 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 that you don't have an unconscious bias. Like, I just wanted to, we all have, and it's very surprising because this is what I love about the organization I'm working on, where that we have constant training every year, every six months to remind us. It's not because you are from, coming from an, a, a, a diverse background that you don't have unconscious bias also, right? So we wanted to create that inclusive world and all of us we have, and it's about be mindful about the vocabulary you use, the comments you do about gender, about people where they're coming from, and independently of your natural, your culture, etc. cetera, we, we all can be hurtful. So it's just about always being mindful and 
empathy, I, I know you mentioned a lot of that word today is, is all about that. Is also develop empathy with you because you cannot be perfect. And sometimes you feel like you, you're super inclusive, you're super diverse, and you say something is not right. And it's okay. But if you have an open dialogue with your peers that they are different and they're coming from different environment, this is really when you start creating a culture when everyone feels that they can have a voice. Uh, but it's definitely is always touch point with people that are not like you, they don't think like you, they don't come from the same background, and then ask questions, like genuine questions and caring questions, where you can learn about yourself and others. And I think these are, I will always encourage every one of us to like rethink and reflect, but it's a, it's a daily uh, exercise. It's not one time, oh, I did a training on diversity and inclusion and unconscious bias, I'm, I'm good with it. No, <laughs> because we are, you know, so many different nationalities and people are so diverse on, in this world. So we, it's something we need to, every time when I feel like a responsible, uh, something is important. Thank you. I would also say, I think it is important to give yourself a bit of grace to not have to be the person who's calling it out all the time. Because as a recipient of the unconscious bias, your feelings can get hurt. And that is a weight to be carried. And the challenge for all of us that are around is to develop allyship so that you can, as a sort of victim or a recipient of an unconscious bias, those individuals have a community to come to and we allies can then step up and advocate on their behalf and not putting them in double jeopardy to feel and be the recipient of that bias and have to call it out and act upon it. So it is okay to take a step back too and not have to confront it head on. Thank you. So that's all the time we have for questions. Um, to the audience, to everyone here, our community, feel free to continue engaging with us and asking any questions or sharing any thoughts by tagging Courage to Create or, and Women Tech Makers. Um, and now it's raffle time. So we're closing out the event and let's all come back together. I know we have a couple of other presenters that are gonna share a bit more about the raffle. Um, but if you could, of course, give let's give a virtual <laughs> Round of applause, our amazing speakers, our amazing leaders. Thank you so much for, for leading the way you lead and um, for bringing your energy and your presence to this today, despite the technical difficulty, difficulties. Thank you so much. <laughs>